Coming up on DTNS, Tim Berners-Lee's plan to save the internet. eBay sells off StubHub, and Rob Dunwood shares why he chose Adele over the new Apple laptop. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, November 25th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Very happy to have co-host of the SMR podcast, Rob Dunwood, back with us on the show. Welcome back, Rob. How's it going? Thanks for having me, folks. So uh, we are going to uh, talk with Rob about laptop choosing, uh, something that Rob has a long history with. I know a lot of you are probably thinking about or have thought about or are going to think about again. Uh, also, just now on our Good Day Internet show, we were talking about ham and turkey <laughs> and power washing. Uh, Sarah had her first power washing experience. If you want that wider conversation, you got to become a patron, patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Tesla's Cybertruck unveil last week included designer Franz von Holzhausen successfully smashing two of the vehicle's armor glass windows on stage with a metal ball. They were not supposed to smash. Now we know why the glass broke, according to Tesla CEO Elon Musk, who tweeted, when von Holzhausen sma smacked the metal door with a sledgehammer before the metal ball test, the impact cracked the base of the glass, which weakened it. This is why you always test the demo exactly the way the demo is supposed to go. Although I guess maybe it didn't crack it in a test. The Risk v Foundation, which sets chip standards, told Reuters it plans to move from Delaware to Switzerland. Uh, universities, governments, of course, companies uh, outside the United States help to develop RISC-V's open source technologies, but some of them are concerned about possible disruption from U.S. trade restrictions. While no restrictions are in place against RISC-V, it's possible that, say, a Chinese company could contribute to the open source technology and then be unable to take advantage of it due to a future restriction, such as those applied to Huawei. So RISC-V's members have suggested it move to neutral territory, which it's going to do. Finland's Solcomp, which supplies iPhone chargers to Apple, is investing 20 billion rupees, that's about 278.67 million U.S. dollars, in Chennai, India, to make mobile chargers and other smartphone components starting in March of 2020. The facility was formerly owned by Nokia. The sale is expected to generate 10,000 new jobs. And on July 18th, Amazon closed parts of its e-commerce operations in China to focus on cross-border sales and cloud services. Now, Amazon announced it will launch a pop-up store on Chinese e-commerce platform Pinduoduo. The pop-up will list about 1,000 non-Chinese products. All right, let's talk a little more about the big decision that came down in London today, Sarah. Yeah, kind of kind of big story today. Transport for London announced it decided not to renew Uber's license to operate in the entire city, saying it found a pattern of failures by Uber. Specifically, TFL said that Uber allowed unauthorized drivers to upload their photos to other drivers' accounts, meaning they were often uninsured. TFL says that this happened on 14,000 trips with 43 drivers. Uber, Uber will appeal the decision and continue to operate in the meantime. Yeah, I've seen that, that you know, uh, that described as allowing unauthorized drivers to do it, but I've also seen it described as a vulnerability. Uh, in other words, something Uber wasn't meaning to happen, but sure. yeah. figured out a workaround or, or a loop in the system to do this. And the idea was you go to a friend's account and say, hey, I can't pass the background check, but I want to make some money. Let me use your account. They'd upload that person's picture so it matched. Uh, but it really wasn't that person. And uh, Transport for London, I feel like, has been looking for a reason not to renew Uber's license, uh, and they seem to have found it. Although, again, for now, Uber's going to continue to operate in London. It's got 21 days to appeal. It's going to appeal, and then it could probably end up uh, working its way through the Supreme Court for for a couple of years. So this is far from done. Uh Rob, uh, you know what do you what do you make of this from from your seat? So you characterized this, I, th I think, perfectly. They were kind of looking for a way to not renew Uber's uh, authorization to work in the city. Uh, so you had that working with you, and I don't want to minimize this. It is a big deal because security gets in there. You know, you've got one driver that you that's been background checked, but you're somebody else that hasn't is showing up. I mean, there there are definitely issues that could pop up from that. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that Uber is going to, this is a vulnerability. We're going to fix it. They're going to come back and you know, we're going to hear additional court cases on this. I don't think they're going to just give up and say, okay, well, we're done in, in, you know, one of the largest cities in the world. 
Yeah, I know that uh, th there's probably pressure being put on uh, Mayor Khan of London to to fight Uber because the black cab uh, people, the the folks who who have to train for years, who have to pass the knowledge where they have to memorize the streets of London in a six mile radius, uh, don't like the idea that somebody can just sign up for Uber, pass a background check. Uh, and be competing with them out there. So so there's pressure on that. And I think there's also a little bit of the political backlash where you're seeing uh, labor, the Labour Party, and they have an election coming up December 12th in, in the UK, the Labour Party sort of pushing against technology companies as part of their platform. Uh, and here's here's an example of, of a Labour Party mayor pushing against one of those technology companies. And I'm sure that is, even if it doesn't play a part in the decision, is certainly going to be used in the campaign. No doubt. When you look at the 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 numbers here, forty three drivers, fourteen thousand trips. So mm -hmm. that's a lot of people taking a lot of trips. Supposedly being those forty three drivers, which they in fact were not. This does not seem like a widespread problem in London. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's it it right. it's and it and it's definitely on the company to figure out how, how to make sure that this doesn't happen in the future. But it does seem like a small number of people saying, "Huh, we can game the system." You know, let's let's. Uh, I I can't drive right now. You drive for me. I'll, you you'll just be me. Well, and and certainly these kinds of it's it's sort of an arms race with this sort of thing where. People will come up with workarounds that you didn't anticipate, and then companies have to figure out how to crack down on them to prevent them. Uh, yeah. I don't know enough about the situation to tell you whether w this was an unanticipated thing by an Uber or with, or if there was some amount of negligence, if they knew about it and let it happen. Uh, but I knew, do know that under Khosrow Shahi, Uber has seemed to be more attentive to this sort of thing. So I'd be surprised if they just turned a blind eye to it. That's more the Travis Kalanick era of Uber. Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah, we there 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 have been some harsh words uh, with some media figures about Dara Khaz Rashahi um, based on the the these recent events. And again, like you said, Tom, it's listen, if Uber knew about it and turned a blind eye, that is one story. But it doesn't really sound like that's the case. It sounds like, you know, some folks in London were 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 figuring out how to get around uh, some stuff and um, Uber's being um, punished for it. Well, we'll all circle back in 2021 and find out uh, what's really happening with the Supreme Court. Uh, meanwhile, Tim Berners-Lee launched Contract for the Web, a set of nine core principles uh, meant to fix the Internet and prevent a digital dystopia. The initiative has received the backing of more than 150 organizations, including Google, Facebook, DuckDuckGo, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, Microsoft, the governments of France and Germany and Ghana. Uh, it's a widespread of backers here. Governments are called on to make sure that everyone can connect to the Internet, that it's available at all times. In other words, don't shut it down. And that fundamental online privacy and data rights are protected. Companies are called on to make the Internet affordable and accessible to all, respect privacy and personal data, and develop tech that supports, quote, the best in humanity and, quote, challenges the worst. And then we, the people, citizens, are asked to be creators and collaborators. Well, check here. All, all four of us are doing that right now. Build strong communities that respect civil discourse and human dignity and fight for the web. Going a little easier on the citizens, I feel like here. But uh, what do you think of, of this platform, Rob? It's uh, it's very grandiose in its aspirations. Uh, mm -hmm. It's It's, you know, I'm all for it. But at some point, you're going to have to, you know, get down to how do you determine what is one thing as compared to what is another thing? You know, there's going to be disagreements. For example, what is acceptable, uh, you know, you know, from an expense standpoint, where does it, you know, what's acceptable here mm -hmm. is not necessarily what's, acceptable is, in India. Yeah. You what's know, affordable, so, right. you know, what's affordable? How, how do you figure those things out? Um, you know, what is being a good citizen as compared to not being a good citizen? You know, how do you figure those things out? So um, I'll ball for this. I like that there are big company names that are signing on to it. But, uh, you know, as with everything, eventually when you get down to the, uh, you know, the minutia is like, OK, what does this mean, really? Um, I think that there's a lot of things that would have to be figured out with this just because it's kind of vague in how these edicts are being pushed out. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of these. Well, you know, I say a lot of these. Tim Berners Lee's uh, contract for the web is its own thing. But 
you you see this come up over time because people get uh, upset and sort of disenfranchised with the way that the internet works these days and the corporations and the manipulation and and all the things that come along with it and we're all used to it. Uh, some of us are better at navigating it than others. I love this idea. I also think that the altruism of it is just, it's, it's very hard to get a... I don't know. A majority. Wait, you don't like altruism? Of... No, I do. I'm just <laughs> saying. I I think it's 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 really hard to get a lot of people on board who are doing things another way already, whether or not yeah, it's the yeah. right way. No, I I think you're both hitting on something that, I, that I've been thinking about too, which is, gosh, it's Tim Berners Lee. So that's somebody who doesn't give up, right? He pushes hard for things. It's 150 organizations that are spread across a lot of different viewpoints. Uh, so it's got a chance of actually making a change. But a lot of times these sorts of calls for action just end up being words and not actions. So I'm hoping this will be the exception. I'm quietly optimistic, I guess. Not even cautiously, just quietly <laughs> optimistic. But but uh yeah, yeah. No, I and I and I don't want to throw water on something that I think is a very no, good idea. And I like it is a good idea. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna hope that I'm wrong when I say we will never hear about this again. Well, moving on to eBay, who announced its plans to sell StubHub to the Swiss ticketing company Viagogo for $4.05 billion in U.S. cash. Viagogo CEO Eric Baker co-founded StubHub, so we're going full circle again here, but he left before its sale to eBay back in 2007. Once completed, StubHub and Viagogo will sell tickets in more than 70 countries. eBay plans to use the proceeds for stock buybacks, dividends, and merger and acquisition investments. The acquisition is expected to close in the end of Q1 of 2020. So there's two ways to look at this, Rob. It's either uh, bad for consumers because you've got consolidation or good for consumers because now you've got a bigger ticketing competitor to companies like Ticketmaster that have sort of dominated it historically. Um, so I am a fan or have been a fan of StubHub. I just hope they don't mess this up. Mm -hmm. um, there is a reason why I would rather get tickets via StubHub than Ticketmaster. Uh, when, you know, when possible. Sometimes you just can't. You have to go to the, you know, to the really, really big guys on the on the block. But I just I hope that this doesn't mess things up because there's a reason why people like it. Um, you know, as compared to some of the other places where you can get tickets. Yeah, and uh, Beatmaster is pointing out there was a, a UK regulator uh, brought a case against uh, Viagogo for for some practices that they said were anti-consumer. Those accusations were dropped, but a lot of people still think that maybe Viagogo is a little bit shady, so hopefully that doesn't affect StubHub as well. Um, we'll see. Yeah, it's uh, it's a, it's an interesting situation. I mean, StubHub also has a, its own amount of shadiness. Not not the platform itself, but people using StubHub to you know buy a bunch of tickets for stuff that they know are going to be in high demand, and then and then and then jack up the prices. True, but I mean that's something that's kind of similar to the uh, to the Uber situation earlier, right? Where yeah. you have to uh, you have to wonder if, right. if that's just an arms race. That. Yeah. yeah. In a 4-3 ruling, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled that the Fifth Amendment bars people from being forced to turn over personal passwords to law enforcement. The ruling overturned a lower court that ordered a suspect in a child pornography case to turn over his 64-character computer password. The prosecution argued that Fifth Amendment protection did not apply in the case due to what's called the foregone conclusion exemption, where the government already knows of the existence, location, and content of the sought after material. In the decision, Justice Deborah Todd wrote that since the password has no physical manifestation, it is treated as the content of the mind, like the combination to a wall safe, which Supreme Court precedent in the United States finds to be testimonial and therefore protected by the Fifth Amendment. I can't incriminate myself by saying the contents of my mind. Both the lower court and the Pennsylvania Supreme Court relied on the US Supreme Court precedents, even though they are in confliction on their ruling, Previous courts have ruled differently on the relationship of the Fifth Amendment to passwords and the whole content of the mind argument. Supreme Courts in Indiana and New Jersey are having similar cases before them right now. So this is going to end up in front of the U.S. Supreme Court at some point. It's just a matter of when. 
Yeah, this one this one's a big one. I actually uh, was before this even showed up in our show notes. Uh, was kind of aware that this was going on, and it just seems like no matter how many times uh, there are rulings this way, you know, you know, prosecutors are going to try to figure out how to make you tell them something that you know. Um, it just seems like they are just pressed on that. You know, to me, it seems like, you know, the password is something that is in my memory. I don't have to tell you what's in my memory. I can, you know, I can choose to, you know, uh, remain silent or I can just not incriminate myself uh, by by telling you something. And in no way am I uh, supporting, you know, what this person has done. But you, you, I don't think that you should be able to compel someone to tell you what is in their mind. Um, so I'm kind of glad that, uh, you know, this is going at least the way that it's going right now, but we'll see what happens when it gets to the Supreme court. It's also, I know this is obvious, but if I say, Rob, I, you need to tell me what's in your mind right now. What's your password? I mean, you could just be like, um, it's this, that's what's in my mind, whether or not it's the right one or not. I mean, it, it, you know, like to compel someone to do that is not really to force their hand yeah, in the any other, way. The other side of it is like the password was 64 characters long. What if you actually really forgot it? Uh, you know, right. what, you know, are you going to be held in contempt of court because you can't remember the ridiculously complex password that you that's up that's up to the judge to decide if you're right. faking it or if you really can't remember? Exactly. 64 character password, though, I'm going to guess is written down somewhere. Maybe it's in a password manager, which then would have a password that he remembered and it, it kind of obviates it. But if it's written down on a post-it note, well, that's a physical manifestation, isn't it? Right. So I don't know. It's, the, it, this is why it's going to be interesting when this finally comes before the Supreme Court, because basically a password is neither the contents of your mind nor a key to a lockbox. It's an, it's somewhere in between those two things. And, and it either needs its own law or, or the Supreme Court's going to have to come up with, with some new brilliant way of categorizing it. Because otherwise you're going to constantly have people seeing it one way or seeing it another, depending on the situation. Next story, also a bit of a head-scratcher. The South China Morning Post reports that in October, China's government removed cryptocurrency mining from a list of activities set for elimination at the end of next year. This came after China's President Xi Jinping publicly endorsed blockchain. Operating cryptocurrency exchanges are banned in China, but mining is not. And Chinese miners make up about 70% of global cryptocurrency mining operations. India is number two at just 4%, so quite a discrepancy there. And the U.S. number three at 1%. Chinese companies Bitmain and Kanan control more than 90% of the energy-efficient mining hardware markets. Yeah, I think it, probably the, the biggest part of the story that stuck out to me was, was just how dominant Chinese companies are in the mining part of this. I mean, I've, I've heard that before, but I'd never seen these, these discrepancies between China at 70% and India at, at 4%. That, that is a much bigger lead than I would have guessed uh, before I knew this. And I think it shows that China realizes the difference between mining, which allows them to economically benefit from cryptocurrency, and exchanges, which a lot of governments, not just China, worry would undermine their own cryptocurrency. So China, of course, cracking down on that, saying, no, you can't pay under the table with cryptocurrencies, but we'll happily mine them for the rest of the world to undermine each other because uh, then we benefit and we're pulling money into our country. Yeah, I read that as we're, one, really good at doing this. Two, mm -hmm. we control the hardware. That does the thing that we're really good at. Three, we're going to continue to allow it to, to happen in our, you know, within our borders. And you're absolutely right. They're not, you know, endorsing the exchanges um, or allowing the exchanges. They're just allowing you to make, you know, to, you know, to mine money uh, that goes into them or, or, or mine cryptocurrency that goes into those exchanges. So, um, yeah, this is probably going to be around for some time in China. Yeah, and part of the reason is is cheap power. Uh, there's there's a lot less expensive power in in many regions uh, of the country uh, than there are uh, in other places of the world. So it, it's not exactly subsidized, but eff effectively a different situation that you might have elsewhere. Uh, I'd be interested to see. I mean, India is four percent because it also has some cheap power arrangements as well. I'd be interested to see if they can make any progress on that. They certainly could have if China had remained banning mining, uh, but they kind of realized the the gold mine, if you'll forgive the expression, that they would have been giving up there. If you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. All right, Rob, uh, before we get into this, uh, real quickly, you, you've got some experience 
purchasing a laptop? Like how how far back do you have in 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 buying laptops and making decisions about about hardware and that sort of thing? The first laptop that I purchased for myself was a um, PowerBook 520C, which is actually a Macintosh laptop. I believe I got that in 1992. Oh, wow. Okay. So we're, we're um, what is that, 20, uh, 27 years ago, 26 years ago, somewhere in that time frame. So I, I, I have been using, and then I was using PCs before that. You know, there weren't laptops since I was a kid. So mm-hmm. I, have, I have personally been using um, computers for pushing 40 years. So they're, they're not new to me. I've had many Macs um, in my experience, but over the years, I have tended to be more on the PC or Linux side of things just because of some of the work that I was actually doing. And, uh, you know, here recently, what I use just really doesn't matter to me. You know, I, I could just as easily and effectively use a Mac as I could a PC. So when I decided that it's time to get a new, um, you know, a new laptop, um, I said, you know, I really should go and look at, you know, the MacBooks, um, you know, particularly the MacBook Pro, which is rated one of the best uh, laptops that you could do um, 4K video editing on, which is one of my use cases that I have for any high end laptop that I was going to be looking at. So I was actually really uh, earlier this year contemplating getting a Mac. And uh, Allison Sheridan, um, you know, a friend of the show, she told me, to, well, you, you might want to hang out a little while because there's going to, you know, you know, around the Thanksgiving time frame, Apple always comes out with generally comes out with new MacBook Pros. You might want to just wait to see what comes out to either potentially get that or see if you can get a price reduction on, you know, the, the previous year's model. Um, so that's exactly what I did. And so I waited until the MacBook um, Pro 16 inch came out, looked at the specs. And um, the the main reason I know we'll start a conversation from here, but the main reason I decided not to go with the MacBook was simply because of the Apple tax. It was significantly more for the same hardware um, than what I was getting into Dell. And I know that you know right now Dell offers a ridiculous discount because of Black Friday deals. That is you know you know you can buy a Dell cheaper at this time of the year that you can any other time of the year, but that's still something that exists. Um, on the Dell that did not exist on the Mac. So when I looked at it, um, you know, all in, I, you know, I, I paid, I think, um, almost $2,700 for my Dell. The comparable uh, MacBook 16, you know, 16 inch MacBook Pro would have been just shy of 4000 mm-hmm. And when I'm looking at, you know, that th- that is a significant tax to pay. Um, for almost identical, you know, hardware. I literally would have had a bit of a bigger screen, but other than that, um, everything else was, you know, was apples to apples. And I, and I'll be honest, I have the 16 inch MacBook Pro, which did not cost me four thousand dollars. Thank goodness, uh, in the configuration that I got. But, but that 16 inch screen doesn't feel that much bigger than the 15.4 inch screen that I was using before. So I'm not sure how much of an advantage that would be to kind of I'd probably depend on the person. But one thing I've noticed, and this occurred to me when you were, were talking about the comparison, it's always really difficult to make a, I want to say apples to apples comparison, but of course hilarious jokes will ensue. But but to make that comparison between a MacBook and any other Windows book, because you can never quite get the configuration to be exactly the same. And what I've found is when you get close enough, you're usually within a margin where the Apple product is more expensive, but not considerably more expensive if you're doing base models. As soon Mm -hmm. as you start adding more RAM, more storage, more processor maybe, that's when things really start to get ridiculous with Apple because they charge you a lot more for RAM and and storage uh, than, than the configurations do at other places like Dell. That's exactly my experience. Um, I believe that like the base models, the difference in price was three or four hundred bucks. Um, if you're not looking at the Black Friday deals that you're getting this week and last week. Um, but when I started, you know, because I'm going to be doing some fairly intensive video editing on here, I bumped the memory up, I bumped mm-hmm. the processor up, um, bumped the video card up. And it's like, man, this is it's like, you know, it goes up $100 here, $100 there on the Dell. It goes up $400 to $600 on the Mac. Um, and, it's like, it, you know, and then the other thing, too, was that when I threw in like three years of Apple Care, which was the max that you could get, at least the max that I thought that I could get, as compared to four years of uh, next day Dell, 
um, mm. with accidental damage. Um, that really jacked the price of that MacBook up as well. So um, when I started to look at that, it's like, man, it's like for, for the price difference, I could just get this. And yeah, the monitor is a little bit smaller, but how often am I not going to be plugged into an external monitor anyway? Um, I'm, I'm not a road warrior. This is something that just so that I can, you know, I can be mobile when I need to be. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, my use case is not going to be working out of a coffee shop doing 4K video editing most of the time. Most of the time, this thing will be sitting on my desk plugged into a 4K OLED monitor. Well, and so, that makes a big difference, right? Because if you were a road warrior, you were always on the move, you didn't have an external monitor to be with you, it might affect, you know, your 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 buying choices otherwise. But knowing that you're you've kind of got a, a place to be, you got you got solid internet, you got an external monitor. I I I recently got a Mac Mini for the same reason where I was like, you know what, I have a lot of other stuff here. I really just need I need the box. That's all I need. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and the other thing too was that um, you know, at some point I might meet more GPU, but I want to plug an external one in. Same thing I would have to do with the you know with the Mac, mm-hmm. or I'm gonna you know maybe I want a second OLED display. Same thing I would do with the Mac. So, you know, really, you know, I, I wanted enough of a base configuration that I can be out in the field and edit a 4K video and not literally want to just slam my head into the desk. Um, but um, you know, I'm not going to be doing it so much. Now, I will say this. If you are, if you are like, if you're, if you're that wedding photographer and you're trying to get stuff done while you're in the truck at the wedding, um, you know, one of the huge benefits that I saw to the MacBook, and it wasn't just a 16. This is actually previous models of the MacBook, that when you're running Premiere, they work off the battery, um, literally orders of magnitude faster than what you get, um, you know, on the Dell XPS. The Dell mm-hmm. XPS, it needs to be plugged in. The thing is very power hungry. But as long as you can plug it in, the Dell does just as well, or in many cases, actually a little better than the MacBook does. So when I just looked at my use cases, am I really going to pay that premium for not ever really being in a situation to where it's going to going to make sense for me? So um, that's why I decided to uh, you know go with the uh, you know with the Dell. And it literally didn't take long because like when, when I saw the price, it's just like I just I can't spend <laughs> that much more on a laptop right. that's not going to do any more for me. Now, the, the, the last thing I want to ask you before, before we move on uh, is about longevity. One, one of the things you'll hear Apple fans say quite a bit is like, ah, oh, but the Macs last longer. And then you can amortize that price out uh, over, the, over the years. Uh, how do you feel about that, and especially considering Dell's longevity? So um, um, I was talking to, you know, to, to a friend. She told me that, yeah, I was Sheridan, you guys know her. Um, oh, yeah. she, she just sold, I think, a five or six-year-old uh, MacBook Pro and got like 700 bucks for it, I believe is what she told me, seven or 750. So the resale value on a MacBook as compared to a Dell, yes, you're going to get that. But I look at it like this. If I keep it the same amount of time, well, I paid $1,300 less for it up front. So that probably is about a wash. I, I know that in six years, I'm not going to be able to sell this thing for 700 bucks. That's that's not going to be the case. But um, I'm not paying that premium for it now. And my support is going to go longer. Um, like I, said, I believe mm-hmm. that the Apple Care was only three years. Yep. I've actually got the Dell Complete Care for four. Um, which, because I, because I am going to be doing like work functions on this, that was important to me to make sure that, you know, I'm not three years in, I'm not ready to go to a new machine yet, but because I have an issue, I really have no choice. It's going to cost half as much to get it fixed as it would to, you know, to, to just replace it. So the actual support was probably the thing that pushed me over. Um, because when I factored in just getting that Dell, um, you know, support next day, um, I was able to, uh, you know, get that for, practically nothing with the Black Friday deals that were going on. Nice. Well, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. We talk about computers there all the time. You can submit stories and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You can also join in the conversation in our Discord, which is very lively, I might add. And you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, let's take a look at what folks are saying to us out there on the wider internet. Yeah, speaking of Patreon, Damien wrote in on uh, your recent uh, editor's desk, Tom, and said, I too have recently observed myself being resistant to change in tech. My last Android phone is dying. For the first time in many years, I didn't buy a flagship. Since Sony is practically non-existent here in Australia, that's where Damien lives, I decided to change to another brand's ecosystem for future upgrades. Options? 
Google Pixel 4, no fingerprint reader. Face unlock, not supported by banks. Deal breaker. Samsung S10. Reviews say fingerprint under glass, unreliable. I don't like their custom software either. Nokia 9. Reviews say fingerprint <laughs> under glass is unreliable. By this stage of the process, I've already decided not to buy a new phone. I want the change. I need the change, but I'm so resistant to giving up the things that I am used to. Yeah, and the, the editor's desk he's referring to is one where I talked about the idea of uh, having a certain amount of resistance and a certain amount of acceptance when you go into different things, like movies and TV shows, but, but also technology. So it was interesting to get uh, Damien's perspective on that. Thank you for that. Yeah, thanks, Damien. I think you know we all suffer from that. Uh, it uh, you know, changes changes tough, even if you know it's going to be better on the other side. Hey, thanks to uh, our patrons. Special shout out at our master and grandmaster levels, including Jeff Wilkes, Sonia Vining, and Tony Glass. Also, thanks to Rob Dunwood for being with us on the show. Rob, where can people keep up with the rest of your fabulous work? Oh, they can check me out over at smrpodcast.com. And then I'm just at Rob Dunwood on pretty much everything. Um, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So hit me up there. Come check our show out. You'll like it. Yeah, it's it's always a good time. Uh, it's it's smart guys doing it uh, and 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 having having fun. You'll ha- you'll you'll feel better if you listen to SMR <laughs> podcast. I'm to say this from experience. You guys you guys cheer me up some days. I really appreciate that. Uh, folks, don't forget if you sign up to be one of our patrons within the next couple of days, you have till November 28th. Uh, we'll send you some free Len Peralta art, our holiday card, a uh, special exclusive drawing that Len did just for this card of me and Sarah and our holiday wishes. That'll be in your mailbox if you sign up or remain a patron and give us your address at patreon.com slash pledges. Look for DTNS. Make sure you've given us your address or just sign up and, and give your address when you sign up to become a Patreon uh, or patron run at patreon.com slash dtns feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is our email address email us early and often we're also live monday through friday 4 30 p.m eastern that's 21 30 utc and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live back tomorrow with patrick beja talk to you then this show is part of the frog pants network get more at frogpants.com Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>